Welcome to Forgotten TV, the podcast that brings you TV memories of the 70s and 80s with a focus on short-lived TV shows, TV pilots, and made-for-TV movies. I'm Chris Cooling, and our last episode took a look at Weekend TV in 1977. If you take a look at IMDb popularity rankings from that same year of 1977, right behind shows like Chips and The Love Boat are shows like The Incredible Hulk and The Amazing Spider-Man. These weren't cartoons. These were live-action superhero shows from the Super 70s. In the mid-70s, was there anything better than turning on the TV on Saturday morning and seeing your favorite comic book superheroes come to life as an animated cartoon? (music) 1973's Super Friends on ABC brought us Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman and Robin, Aquaman and other heroes as animated cartoons. What we're going to look at on today's podcast is the live-action superheroes of the 70s. And there is no better place to start than on Saturday morning. Chosen from among all others by the immortal elders Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, Mercury, Billy Batson and his mentor travel the highways and byways of the land on a never-ending mission to right wrongs, to develop understanding, and to seek justice for all. In time of dire need, young Billy has been granted the power by the immortals to summon awesome forces at the utterance of a single word. A word which transforms him in a flash into the mightiest of mortal beings, Captain Marvel. CBS Saturday Morning of September 1974 brought us Shazam, based on the comic book character appearing in Wiz Comics, published by Fawcett Comics, from February 1940 until 1953. Shazam was the TV version of Captain Marvel. In 1972, DC Comics licensed the Captain Marvel characters and returned them to print after decades of being out of print. And in 1974... Filmation and producers Norm Prescott and Lou Scheimer brought Shazam to Saturday Morning TV. The series lasted three seasons and 28 episodes. Starring Michael Gray as Billy, aged a little bit beyond his comic book years for the series, Les Tremaine was Mentor, a character sort of adapted and invented uh, for the show, and Jackson Bostwick, for season one as Captain Marvel himself, replaced later by John Davey for seasons two and three. The show did take some liberties from the original source material. For one thing, it did away with the wizard Shazam and replaced him with characters known as the Elders. The Elders were immortal and were depicted via animation. Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, and Mercury, which together forms the magical word Shazam, which uh, Billy would utter and be transformed into another person, Captain Marvel. One other change from the original source material was that Billy and Mentor, the awkwardly named character, would drive around California in a 1973 Dodge Open Road motorhome, complete with a mobile phone, for the mid-70s, that was, uh, that was quite something. One aspect that was brought over from the comic book was the device of the Eternophone. While Mentor had his mobile phone in the motorhome, Billy had the Eternophone, a device that was brought over from the comics. In times of need, he could actually call the elders for advice. Oh, elders, fleet and strong and wise, appear before my seeking eyes. Someday your own image, your own identity must be revealed to save a human life. Oh, I'm not sure I understand, Solomon. 
You may meet someone less fortunate than you, someone who feels he cannot cope with society. But you can be the one to show him how wrong he is, how worthwhile he can really be. I can? Now, perhaps by remembering what the poet Wordsworth once said, that best portion of a good man's life is his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Elders, you talk of love and courage, but I'm not sure what it all means. It is not our intention that you understand everything clearly now, Billy, only that you will use this knowledge when you need it. But Solomon... Good luck, Billy. Notable guests appearing on Shazam were 70s every teen Lance Kerwin, from the Munsters, Butch Patrick. From the Partridge family, Danny Bonaducci. Uh, Dabs Greer, who was Reverend Alden on Little House on the Prairie. Uh, Jimmy McNichol. Uh, and both Eric Shea and Patrick Laberto from Little House on the Prairie. Every episode of uh, Shazam ended with a lesson or a moral that would be taught. Hi. Today you saw what happens when people show disrespect to the land, history, and artifacts of other peoples. As the elders said, the desert and traditions of other people have much to teach us and must be preserved for future generations to see and to know. See you next week. The complete series of Shazam! All 28 episodes are available on DVD. After a year on CBS on Saturday morning, a format change was in order. The Shazam! Isis Hour! A full hour of exciting adventure with the world's most powerful mortals. Captain Marvel, champion of truth and justice. And Isis, dedicated foe of evil. Both together in the Shazam! Isis Hour! Yes, after Captain Marvel was alone by himself for a full year on Saturday Morning TV, producers Lou Scheimer and Norm Prescott invented a new character to be his companion on Saturday Morning. Queen, said the royal sorcerer to Hatshepsut, with this amulet, you and your descendants are endowed by the goddess Isis with the powers of the animals and the elements. You will soar as the falcon soars, run with the speed of gazelles, and command the elements of sky and earth. 3,000 years later, a young science teacher dug up this lost treasure and found she was heir to the secrets of Isis. And so, unknown to even her closest friends, Rick Mason and Cindy Lee, she became a dual person, Andrea Thomas, teacher. Oh, my Jesus. And Isis, dedicated foe of evil, defender of the weak, champion of truth and justice. Originally just titled Isis, this show appeared alongside uh, Shazam in September of 1975. The title later was renamed The Secrets of Isis for Syndication. This show was the first weekly American live-action TV series with a female superhero lead character. As such, it uh, predates The Bionic Woman, Wonder Woman, and other shows. In the series, Andrea Thomas was played by Joanna Cameron a science teacher at a California high school, and on an archaeological dig, she digs up an ancient amulet, as explained in the opening. She discovers that she actually is a descendant of Queen Hatshepsut, an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, which I believe was one of the first or the only female pharaohs there was. Just like the opening says, she discovers she commands the powers of the animals and the elements, and uh, could transform herself into the goddess Isis uh, whenever she needed. The series lasted for two seasons and 22 episodes. Brian Cutler co-starred as her fellow teacher Rick Mason. 
In uh, early episodes, Cindy Lee was played by actress Joanna Pang and uh, later was replaced uh, by Rolanda Douglas as Rennie Carroll, uh, who replaced the Cindy character. Some of the various powers that Isis manifested was that uh, she could fly. She had superhuman strength. Um, as the opening says, commands the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. So as such, she can control the weather and matter itself, pass through solid materials. Um, what was it? Divining the recent past, controlling gravity, basically anything that the writers would come up with, uh, she probably would be able to do in that episode. We will return to ISIS after these messages. Mego presents the Star Trek action figures featuring the crew of the Enterprise, Captain James T. Kirk, their fearless leader, Dr. Bones McCoy, caring for the health of the Enterprise crew, Scotty, the chief engineer, in charge of the transporter room, Mr. Spock, the Vulcan, second in command, and the Klingon, enemy of the Star Trek crew. Star Trek action figures, complete with accessories shown. Each sold separately from Mego. And now, back to Isis. When someone dares you to do something, it's often something that's either dangerous or wrong to do for some other reason. So the real question isn't whether you have the guts enough to do it or not. The question is, do you have enough nerve not to take the dare? Doing anything that you know is wrong is dumb because you're the one who pay for it. See you next week. Like Shazam, Isis had morals at the end of each episode. Uh, something which would become standard later in the 80s on shows such as G.I. Joe, The Thundercats, and on segments like NBC's The More You Know. These were often delivered like with a wink and a nod to the audience. And this was something that was carried over even from the beginning episode where uh, Joanna Cameron would wink at the audience when she was in the guise of Andrea Thomas' science teacher. Um, this was something that was obviously carried over from the Lois Lane, Clark Kent uh, interplay that was done for the TV series uh, Adventures of Superman. Here's another example of one of those morals that would play at the end of each episode. Being responsible means many things. It means helping mom and dad around the house when you'd rather be outside playing with your friends. It means telling the truth. And it means keeping a promise you've made. But mostly, being responsible means knowing the right thing to do and doing it. See you next week. Isis, or The Secrets of Isis, was released in 2007 as a complete series on DVD, but is out of print for several years. If you buy one from one of these resellers on eBay or Amazon, you need to be careful of which one you order. There was a disc released in 2012 that only contains seven episodes. I think they're the first seven of season one. And uh, this disc still commands 50 to $80 on Amazon, and uh, the complete series uh, runs often over $100 on either eBay or Amazon. So buyer beware, be careful on what you order. <laughs> Meanwhile, over at ABC... Yes, it's Wonder Woman, the ABC TV movie from March of 1974, starring Kathy Lee Crosby and written by John D.F. Black. Now, Wonder Woman in this incarnation did not have her traditional 
recognizable costume. Um, the best way I can describe it is she was wearing a modest, full coverage, evil Knievel star spangled tracksuit that looked more suited to something Steve Austin would wear on the six million dollar man than what Wonder Woman would wear. A lot of the traditional elements were left out of this incarnation. Instead of her lasso, she had like a gold colored repelling cable that would come out of her belt. She did have bracelets, but never deflected bullets with them. Um, this version of the character was strongly influenced by what was going on in the comic books of the time. If you're not familiar with it, in the late 60s, comic books were depowering their characters. We had society questioning old values, um, society's changing. These things are being reflected in the comic books of the day. So in 1968, Wonder Woman lost her powers and just became Diana Prince for a time. I think uh, until uh, 1972. This is known as the Diana Prince or the I Ching era of, of the comic title. And um, she was more of an Emma Peel spy character than a superhero. Well, this movie is slow moving and suffered from a lot of issues, uh, not the least of which was the budget. Um, it definitely needed a rewrite from Mr. Black. There were a lot of men hitting on Diana in the film. There were awkward situations. The character mythology was unclear. She's recognized as Wonder Woman in plain clothes as she walks into a hotel lobby. Wonder Woman. She's here. Also, does she have powers? It's really unclear. She's athletic. Kathy Lee Crosby pre presents her well, and she tosses the spear and serves the character at probably as best that she could, given the script. An inordinate amount of time is actually spent following a donkey around the Arizona desert. We give the burro a command in Spanish, slap it on the rump, and leave. The villain was played by Ricardo Montalban, so that had some potential there, but never really amounted to much. The plot revolved around code books that were being stolen, and they would identify all of the operatives throughout the world or something like that. It was, it was really unclear. Uh, this version of Wonder Woman, which was intended to be a pilot, uh, had it been successful, ABC was quoted as saying the ratings for it were respectable, but not exactly wondrous. So it, does, it was not picked up as a series. This TV movie is readily available on DVD from the Warner Archive. Wonder Woman, I love you. Summer of 1942, the onslaught of the Third Reich continues under the leadership of this indecent and corrupt man. His overtrained and blindly obedient army continues to ravish what is left of free Europe, while Il Duce grasps for his place as this wicked Axis tries to dominate the world. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill gather the Allies in defense of the free world. The Third Axis power plunders across the Pacific. Mankind is being threatened by these despicable villains. The only hope for freedom and democracy is... Wonder 
Now we're talking. After a lukewarm Kathy Lee Crosby TV movie that we just talked about, a superhero finally has a hit show in prime time, complete with exciting visuals and an upbeat theme song, and something that was faithful to the source material as well. Audiences loved this show. Yes, Wonder Woman finally came to television. Wonder Woman was created by William Moulton Marston in 1941. As women were entering the workforce in historically male occupations to support the war effort. The character first appeared in All Star Comics in December of 1941, and a Wonder Woman title has been published by DC Comics almost continuously since that time. Wonder Woman was developed for television by Douglas S. Kramer and Stanley Ralph Ross. It first appeared in November of 1975 as a TV movie slash pilot on ABC television. And uh, season one also aired on ABC. The show moved to CBS for seasons two and three. So we got three seasons of the show in 60 episodes. This show had a healthy distribution in syndication after its initial airing and even airs today on the weekends on MeTV and is affectionately remembered by many. Now, unlike the previous TV movie that we just talked about, this Wonder Woman was fairly faithful to the original source material, although she didn't fly or coast on the jet stream or however the, uh, the old comics put it. The costume was virtually the same, including the magic lasso of truth, her bracelets, her tiara, and even her invisible plane. For the star, the producers cast Linda Carter, a relatively unknown 5'9", 23-year-old beauty queen turned actress. After Wonder Woman, Linda Carter went on to star in a couple of TV series with uh, limited success and was uh, a guest star in a number of TV movies and shows, and has recently appeared in the Supergirl TV series as the American President. Lyle Wagner was cast as Major Steve Trevor, who was well known to U.S. audiences for his seven years appearing on The Carol Burnett Show. After his stint on Wonder Woman, he found himself making the rounds on such shows as Charlie's Angels, The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Happy Days, and so on. Later on, he would find success in the construction industry as uh, a builder of RVs and trailers for Hollywood stars. Deborah Winger actually starred in three episodes of this series as one of her earliest acting roles as Wonder Woman's sister, Drusilla. Dressed this way, she's a navy wave. But beneath that uniform, she is the Wonder Woman doll. And now you can create your own Wonder Woman adventures with these other dolls. Major Steve Trevor, Nubia, Wonder Woman, Super Foe. Gotcha, Major. Wonder Woman, hurry! I'll save you, Major. As soon as I tie up this cute little thing. Wonder Woman, Major Steve Trevor, and Nubia dolls sold separately by Mego. Both the pilot TV movie and season one are set in 1940s during World War II. In the pilot TV film, Major Steve Trevor crashes into the ocean near Paradise Island, the home of the comparatively immortal race of Amazon women that lives sequestered from the modern world. They become aware of World War II and the Nazi threat to the entire world. Princess Diana is sent to take Steve Trevor back to America, as well as to assist the forces of freedom and democracy as Wonder Woman. She's given a costume that resembles a one-piece swimsuit with stars and stripes, and is outfitted with the secret belt of strength, the lasso of truth, which makes people tell the truth and follow commands in a sort of hypnotic state. Now, this is interesting because William Moulton Marston actually was the inventor of the polygraph machine, colloquially known as the lie detector, the effectiveness of which is now known to be highly specious, to say the least. The bracelets that she's given are made of the mystic metal feminum that's mined only on Paradise Island and serves to deflect bullets. Her tiara can become a throwing weapon, and the crystal inside is some kind of magic radio allowing her to communicate with her mother, the queen. But let's let Hippolyta explain. Magic bracelets. Your tiara.
The costume with the secret belt of strength. The golden lasso of truth and then forgetfulness. The garb of justice. My daughter, they are yours. Remember, in the outside world, without these things that I've given you, you are only an ordinary woman with no special powers. I remember. If you need me, you can contact me through the ruby in your tiara. I'm proud of your daughter. And I'm worried for you, of course. Children always have to go. And parents always have to stay and wait. And worry. She also inexplicably has an invisible plane, which she conveniently uses to transport Steve to America. Now, initially, she becomes Wonder Woman by doing a, a twirling strip tease, and her clothes are magically replaced by the Wonder Woman costume, and she hides her clothes in a drawer or closet somewhere. And later on, a much more exciting explosion of light is added, and her regular clothes are magically transformed into her costume, doing away with the pesky need to hide them. Throughout the 13 additional episodes were given of season one, she fights the Nazi threat to the free world. The tone of this season is fairly tongue-in-cheek, but not played to the ridiculous level that the 1966 Batman series was. Still, Wonder Woman had some strong opinions about women's place in society. And any civilization that does not recognize the female is doomed to destruction. Women are the wave of the future. Season two saw some major changes. The move to CBS in seasons two and three moved the show to modern day 1977 and were done on a much cheaper budget than the original 1940s season one. This meant that Lyle Wagner started playing Steve Trevor Jr., the original Steve Trevor's son, who also coincidentally crashes near Paradise Island, is rescued by the Amazons, and is returned to America by Wonder Woman in sort of a rehash of the original story. In this updated version, Diana joins the fictional IADC, or the Interagency Defense Command, and fights modern threats such as terrorists, mad scientists, alien invasions, and evil rock stars. Elements such as the Iraq supercomputer are added to further modernize the show. 1978's Season 3 downplayed Steve Trevor altogether and had Diana on missions that incorporated late 70s fads such as disco, skateboarding, computer dating, and dirt bikes. A Wonder Woman could now transform into dedicated costumes for these activities. The theme song was even updated with a disco beat. The totally 1970s guest star lineup in the CBS era included Martin Mull, Roddy McDowell, Dak Rambo, Frank Gorshin, Henry Gibson, Rick Springfield, Ed Begley Jr., Gary Berghoff, Leif Garrett, Ron Ely, Gavin McLeod, Wolfman Jack, Shields and Yarnell, Ike Eisenman, and Robbie the Robot. Wonder Woman The Complete Series is available on DVD. Next time on Forgotten TV... The world's favorite comic book hero, followed by 84 million readers a year. Now, he comes alive. For the first time on the screen, you'll see it all. The spectacular adventures of the amazing Spider-Man. He can do the things a spider does, you know, uh, climb walls and, and spin webs, and he's very, very strong. You've heard about him. You've read about him. Now, you'll see him in action. Kill him. No challenge is too great. 
No enemy is too strong. The most popular, most daring, most exciting superhero in the entire world. At last, he comes alive for his most incredible adventure. That's next time on Forgotten TV. And I'd like to thank the following YouTube channels for making today's audio clips possible. Warner Archive, 11DB11, Wonder Woman 1942, Diana Prince, and a special thanks to Mark Giacoma at VHS Rewind for finding us those rare bumpers and morals clips from the Isis and Shazam hour. Forgotten TV is now on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. To support Forgotten TV and interact with me on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, as well as my Amazon link, all of that is linked up for you there at the website at Forgotten.tv. I'm Chris Cooling, and we'll see you next time on Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV.